Sad. After three decades and numerous educational campaigns for advancing public awareness, there is still a lot of misinformation floating around about HIV-AIDS. And some of these misconceptions were debunked decades ago, but are still widely believed. Well, in honor of the upcoming annual Madness Mayhem and Charity fundraiser for HIV-AIDS this month, I've decided to take this opportunity to dispel a lot of the myths that are still circulating about this disease. Believe it or not, this one is still popular. The short answer is, no it's not. HIV is a blood-borne lentivirus, just one in a family of viruses that infect numerous animal species, including non-human primates, cats, horses, cows, goats, and sheep. And it most certainly does not discriminate. So why then is it considered a gay disease? There are a few reasons, which I'll get to in just a moment, but first, I think it would help to remind everyone how HIV is spread. As I said, it's a blood-borne virus, so it can only be spread through blood, semen and vaginal secretions, and breast milk. In the Western world, pregnant women who are HIV positive can receive antiretroviral drugs, which can reduce the possibility of transmitting the virus to their fetuses as, to as low as 1%. And then, obviously, simply not breastfeed after the birth. And of course, the blood supplies of developed nations are heavily screened for HIV. So these two methods of transmission are practically nil in these areas. So that leaves two main methods of transmission here. Unprotected sex and intravenous drug users sharing infected needles. But most of the world's population living with HIV AIDS is not in the developed world. Over half of all people living with HIV are female, and 68% of those living with HIV reside in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the main methods of transmission are through heterosexual sex and from infected mothers to their babies, either through birth or breastfeeding. With numbers like that, it's ridiculous to assume that gay men are more at risk than anybody else. Ignorance, complacency, and lack of access to proper medical care are the factors that put people at the most risk. The misconception can be traced back to the first diagnosed cases of AIDS. Back in January 1981, an article published in the CDC's weekly newsletter, which is read by millions of medical doctors nationwide, detailed unusual clusters of pneumocystis pneumonia in five patients who were all gay men. This led to more discoveries of the same pneumonia clusters being cited in other healthcare establishments across the country, along with an unexplained rise in Kaposi sarcoma which used to be a very rare form of cancer, since it only manifests in people with highly suppressed immune systems. At first, the majority of cases being reported were gay men, and the initial assumption was some sort of sexually transmitted infection that was somehow limited to the gay community. So the mystery infection was dubbed GRID, which stood for Gay-Related Immune Deficiency. However, this term was quickly dropped when it became clear that half of the people showing signs of the same mysterious illness were not gay men, but also heterosexual men and women and children, most of whom were Haitian immigrants, intravenous drug users, and hemophiliacs. Because of this, the CDC realized that the mystery illness was not limited to the gay community, and despite just having been discovered, must have been spreading within the population for many years since it had already infiltrated many different groups. And for this reason, the CDC rejected the term GRID and officially renamed the disease AIDS in August 1982. The higher rate of transmission during unprotected anal sex is why so many people erroneously still believe that it's primarily a gay disease. And this is basically due to anatomy. The tissues in and around the rectum are far more prone to tearing than, say, the vagina, which is more elastic and creates its own lubrication. These tears leave the body extremely vulnerable to infections that have a direct access to the bloodstream, making HIV transmission 18 times higher in this method. Some folks are thinking, aha, see, it is a gay disease. Despite the fact that straight people also engage in anal sex, and again, over half of all people living with HIV aren't even men, let alone gay men, and there has never been a documented case of HIV transmission through sex between women. That means that the primary method of HIV transmission worldwide is through heterosexual sex. So much for being a gay disease. <sighs> Back in 
Back in 1987, author Randy Schultz published his book, And the Band Played On, which gave an account of the first years of the AIDS epidemic. He identified French-Canadian flight attendant Gaetan Dugas as patient zero, and claimed that he had been the person who carried the disease all over the world and then back to North America. While Dugas had been a promiscuous gay flight steward who died of AIDS in the early years after it was discovered, we now know that he couldn't have been the so-called patient zero. The disease was already making his rounds before he even became a flight attendant. Robert Rayford was a 16-year-old boy from St. Louis, Missouri, who died in 1969 of a dysfunctional immune system and Kaposi sarcoma. His preserved tissue samples revealed that he had had HIV. And since he had never been out of the country, or even to any major metropolitan cities, that means that HIV had been in North America for quite some time, spreading quietly among the population. The first confirmed case of HIV infection ever was from a 1959 preserved blood sample of a Congolese man. A 1960 sample of a lymph node biopsy from a Congolese woman also tested positive for HIV. A Norwegian sailor contracted HIV around 1966 while he traveled to several African ports. He and his wife died of what was later determined to be AIDS in 1976, and their nine-year-old daughter died from the disease in 1986. Greta Rask was a Danish surgeon who contracted the virus sometime during the 1960s while she practiced medicine in Zaire. She died in 1977. By using the molecular clock method, it is believed that HIV sprung from the simian virus and crossed over into humans sometime during the late 19th century and early 20th century in West Central Africa, where chimpanzees are hunted and sold as bushmeat. People in that area have been contracting SIV for thousands of years but it's typically a weak virus quickly suppressed by a healthy immune system. It is believed that through several transmissions, the SIV virus was able to mutate into HIV and was limited to the populations in that area until the urbanization of Africa gave the disease its gateway to the rest of the world. Even well-meaning people make this mistake. And while I admit that I have a reputation for being nitpicky, this isn't a case of arguing semantics. The terms HIV and AIDS are not the same and shouldn't be used synonymously. When someone is diagnosed as being HIV positive, it means that the person has been infected with either the HIV-1 or HIV-2 virus that is manifested by high replication of the virus in their blood, which is measured by viral load, and a drop in CD4 helper T cells, which are vital to the strength of one's immune system. It is only when the number of CD4 T cells drops below 200 per microliter is when a person is diagnosed with AIDS. That's the difference. HIV positive does not mean AIDS. It means that a person is infected with the virus that will, without treatment, eventually result in AIDS. And even then, the person is not necessarily dying. Viral loads can be reduced, and CD4 T cell counts can be increased. Once upon a time, AIDS was a terminal illness, and depending on where you happen to live, it still can be. In the developed world, however, people have a better shot at living out their lives and staying healthy. Some of you are aware that my partner, Dev Shell 2, who runs the Madness Mayhem and Charity Fundraiser, is HIV positive, and he's actually very healthy. All of his blood work results show healthy levels of cholesterol and blood pressure, and he has a high CD4 T cell count. This is made possible by the famous triple cocktail of highly active antiretroviral drugs, which are extremely effective in blocking the virus from replicating itself. Without replication, the viral load rapidly drops to the point where the virus will be undetectable in the person's blood, as it has in Rob's body. That means if he takes an HIV test now, it'll come back negative. Does that mean he's cured? Unfortunately, no. The virus is still there and will replicate itself if he stops taking the antiretrovirals. But, it not only keeps him from developing AIDS, it also keeps him as healthy as anyone else. The main problem with these drugs is that they aren't available to most of the world's infected people. They're incredibly expensive, and will remain so, and most people could never afford them out of pocket. And that is why the illness continues to ravage unchecked and devastate entire countries in the undeveloped world. A vaccine, however, would likely be less costly and the only real way to eradicate the disease. Immoral. 
as in sexually immoral, or people who use illicit intravenous drugs. With the virtual elimination of contracting HIV through donated blood products, or even Western mothers passing it on to babies, there are a lot of people who take a moralistic view to this kind of disease. The common argument is, they bring it on themselves. It's not my problem. First of all, it's so crass to just dismiss one of the most destructive pandemics in human history as a mere morality tale. Since its discovery just over 30 years ago, it has killed more than 25 million people, and there are about 34 million people living with it now. In my personal opinion, accusations of immorality are cast by people who foolishly believe that they themselves are at no risk of contracting HIV-AIDS. The truth is, everyone who is sexually active is at some amount of risk, and it doesn't matter if a person has ever had only one partner. I mean, if you're monogamous, you know what you're doing, but do you really know what your partner is doing? Are you with that person every single second of every day? Secondly, the biggest and worst health problems are non-communicable diseases. For example, the number one global killer is heart disease, which, while having some genetic predispositions, people bring it on themselves from unhealthy lifestyles of bad diet and lack of exercise. 346 million people live with diabetes, and 90% of them have type 2 diabetes, which is most commonly caused by obesity and being overly sedentary. Lung cancer kills more people worldwide than any other cancer, which is most often, but not always, caused by tobacco smoking. Alcohol is the world's third largest factor in disease, causing 2.5 million deaths per year through its harmful use. Thirdly, as I mentioned earlier, most of the people living with HIV-AIDS are in sub-Saharan Africa, where most of the victims are women and children. Many of them contracted it from their husbands, or, more tragically, through rape which is rampant in many superstitious, warlord-ridden African countries where some folks still believe that sex with virgins can cure AIDS. So the belief that HIV-AIDS only infects people who behave irresponsibly is patently false. And even if it was, so the f what? As human beings, our focus should be to save lives rather than wag fingers. present time, it is estimated that it would take more than a lifetime to completely kill an HIV infection with the antiretroviral drugs that are currently being used. So far, clinical vaccine trials have not yielded any products that can, with confidence, be touted as preventing HIV infection. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible. Personally, I think what has inspired such pessimism in some folks is the fact that a vaccine or cure hasn't been found yet because the old ways of developing vaccines are ineffective in this case. For example, the answer to a scary disease like, for example, polio, is to take a small inactive portion of what can make you ill and use it to make yourself immune. But that doesn't work with HIV. It adapts and evolves to the pressures put on it by the immune system. There are several clinical trials being conducted currently that, so far, have yielded varying amounts of effectiveness against future infection. As for a cure, the trick seems to be destroying latent forms of HIV after antiretroviral drugs have rendered the infection undetectable. Well, that's one possible solution. To date, there has been one disputed case of a person being cured of HIV. Timothy Ray Brown of Berlin was hit with a double whammy, HIV and leukemia. In 2007, he received a bone marrow transplant from a donor who was a homozygous carrier of CCR5 gene, of whom people have a natural resistance to infection of the HIV-1 virus. Not only did it cure his leukemia, but all traces of the HIV infection are gone. He was effectively cured of HIV, or at least to the point in which he no longer needs the antiretroviral drugs. The moral of the story is, Never say never. I am really sorry, but the truth is, I cannot address the subject of AIDS denialism without becoming emotional. It's not a topic that I can remain composed while discussing because of the damage that it continues to wreak upon the vulnerable and the sick. Long story short, 
There are those who call themselves dissidents. I call them dickheads. I make no apologies for that. They spread misinformation that cost people their lives, plain and simple. So, instead, I highly suggest checking out Concordance's videos on the subject, which are brilliantly done and very informative. And I'm going to leave it at that. As always, my sources are down there in the description box, along with links to my previous video and the Facebook page for the Madness Mayhem and Charity event on Blog TV next weekend. As for me, I'll be hosting from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. on that Saturday. Again, my previous video has all the information about the time and dates. So, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you all there.